Hello ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be talking about the Jababa London system with the move c6, which arises from the move order d4, knight f6, knight c3, d5, bishop f4, and c6. So the point of the move c6 is to prevent the knight b5 jump. It's very similar to the move a6, but it's a little bit less flexible because it commits this pawn to c6 and it doesn't allow this uh, knight to develop very easily. So obviously this means that this knight is going to develop through means of d7. A6 is a move that I have covered in a completely separate video, so if you're interested in that, please consider checking that out. It is in the Jabava London system uh, playlist, as well as all the other videos on the Jabava London. We play the move E3 here, and at this point your opponent has four moves. Only one or two of them are actually decent. Everything else gives us a very nice and comfortable advantage. So we're going to be talking about Bishop F5, G6, Queen B6, and the move E6. Let's start with the most popular move, which is bishop f5. This is the move that you're going to face 90% of the time, and it is by far the best move. The point of bishop f5 is to obviously play e6 next and close down the center without blocking in your light square bishop. We can play a number of moves here. The most popular move here is by far f3, and it is the move that I like the most. I think it is one of the best moves. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have added a eval bar as per the request of one of the viewers from some of the previous videos. So now you guys are able to see the, what the eval bar says and what the engine thinks uh, as the variation progresses. So the move we're going to be talking about today is f3 in this sort of position. You could also play knight f3. This has been played quite a bit in recent times. The point is that you want to jump this knight into e5 and then kick this bishop out with g4, which is something you're not able to do previously because, well, there's a knight and bishop both attacking this g4 pawn. With the knight on e5, of course, it protects this g4 square, so that is a possibility. Um, but instead, we're going to look at f3, and f3 sets up g4. I think this is a slightly better move. It takes up more space, and it's going to end up in a very, very tactically rich game for us. After f3, your opponent has two moves, e6 and h6. I'm just going to talk about e6 and briefly mention h6 because they literally fully transpose into each other, so... There's no point in studying both since they're quite literally the same variation. After e6, you're going to play g4, sending this bishop back to g6, and you're going to play h4. Here your opponent can play h6 or h5. Both of these are fine, but if your opponent plays h5, you have to play g5. This is the best move by far because it kicks this knight out. And if you were to trade the pawn, you're just going to lose any sort of initiative you might have had because you're going to break apart your pawn structure and it's not going to look very pretty. After this knight moves away, you can play knight g2. The point of this move is that it takes away the sting from this uh, bishop pin because now this knight is ready to recapture whenever needed. You can play a3, kick this bishop out, continue with b4. This king is quite safe in the center, actually, and if anything, it can actually always castle queenside and then just move its way to b1 and then uh, b2 if need be. So there's not really much to worry about here. You can push pretty much all of your pawns up. Uh, currently, your weakness resides in the fact that this c2 pawn is quite, you know, poorly placed. This is one of our biggest issues in the Jabba London system. So a lot of the time, you're going to be moving this knight to a4 and getting ready to push this pawn up. As well, you're going to be prepared to play bishop h3 whenever you need to. You can develop your queen to d2. And sometimes you might even avoid castling altogether and just keep your king in the center as long as it's safe. Bishop d6 to finish off the variation. Now the king is not capable of castling and you should be completely fine. This position is slightly better for white. It is very difficult for black to play. If your opponent plays h6, you can simply play bishop d3. At this point, there's no point of playing h5 because the bishop just slides back and really you haven't achieved that much. It's actually better to keep your pawn on h4. That way you're able to prepare a g5 potentially in the future if that's what you would like to achieve. And a lot of the time that is what we want to achieve. So... Keep your options flexible, just play bishop d3. You do not mind trading this bishop off if this happens, you capture the queen and you're just very happy. Um, you know, bishop d6, you know, knight g2 once again. At this point, it's not to protect this knight from any pin, but it's rather to be able to recapture with the knight in case of a bishop trade. Your, let's say your opponent plays queen c7. Of course, if the bishop trade occurred, you would just recapture with the knight and you're very happy there. I mean, much more superior development for your pieces here. Uh, but if your opponent plays queen c7, you can just start by taking this pawn right away, and then you can prepare something like castling, and then e4, breaking open this pawn structure. And at this point, you have two very strong central pawns, you have very good pressure on this d-file, and of course, you have the threat of e5. How do we identify a plan in this position? What do we do from here, right? How do we figure out what we want to do? Well, if our opponent castles kingside, which would be a very strange decision, we are going to continue with g5 and open up this rook. After the rook has opened up, we can side our queen over to h3 and then try to go for checkmate. Very simple. 
If our opponent does not castle kingside and let's say castles queenside, our plans are a little bit different. Uh, I mean, first of all, we have e5, which just simply wins one of these pieces. But let's say your opponent takes this pawn first. You can just start with e5, taking this queen away, let's say to e7. And at that point, you can start bringing over other pieces and involving them, let's say knight e4. This allows for this knight jump to d6, where it's going to be super powerful. You can rotate this rook to g1. Um, or even the rage rook to g1 if you really wanted to, but rook dg1 is a little bit better. And it also opens up the opportunity for attacking these pawns. And then you're going to use the extra space you have to create, you know, a sizable advantage. At this point, you're just preparing 96, moving the rook over to g1, taking the pawn if possible, and expanding further with the extra space you have. That summarizes everything after e6. Now, let's look at what happens after h6. And I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the positions are going to be pretty much the exact same. So just learn the ideas, just learn the ideas, learn the plans. The plans are uh, attack the king if he castles kingside. And if not, just use those pawns to expand, control as much space as possible, and slowly but surely chip away at black's weak kingside. At this point, after the bishop has retreated, we can play h4. Uh, bishop d3 here is another good option if you really want to play in the same style as mentioned earlier. It doesn't really matter all that much though. After h4 and e6, you can just play bishop d3 anyway, and we've transposed into the exact same variation as previously mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, this summarizes everything to do with bishop f5. Now let's look at the move g6. By the way, if you guys have been finding this video useful, please consider liking and subscribing. It helps my channel out a ton, and it will help you stay notified when future videos come out. Thank you. G6 is a tricky move, but it is a move that we have covered actually in a previous video. The Enkedo variations in the Jibaba London system are quite popular, so it's important to be well versed in those. And if you're not, please consider checking out a video that is going to be linked right above me. It covers everything to do with the move G6 and Bishop G7. Now, I'm also going to briefly mention what we do in this position because C6 isn't something you will see, you know, exclusively in those sort of variations. This is quite unique to this position. However, our ideas are extremely similar. We start with h4, and the reason for that is, well, if black is going to fee in Keto here, it's most likely that black is going to castle kingside, because that is the shortest path to castling. So by playing h4, we're preparing h5 eventually, uh, maybe after knight f3 and knight e5, and something like bishop e2. And we want to play h5 so that we can break away the spawn structure and weaken black's kingside. We can get h5. Sometimes we'll also get bishop d7. Uh, both of these are very similar. All you need to do is pretty much play uh, knight f3. And if you get the spin, annoying pin with bishop g4, just bishop e2, and there's really nothing to worry about. Let's say knight e7, we're going to play knight e5, trade all of these pieces off, and you're very much happy in this position because this knight is very annoying. It's protecting all of these g4 and h5 squares. So maybe a couple of moves later, you can just straight up capture this knight and play something like g4. For example, if your opponent castles here, you can just castle queenside. And after something like h5, you can capture this knight and then play g4, breaking open this pawn structure and creating an attack. And of course, after this, you're going to set up h5, bring this rook over to g1, and you're just going to have a devastating attack on your opponent. Now, I should mention that this isn't, you know, particularly losing for black. This is better for white, for sure. But if your opponent responds very accurately, uh, I mean, this is going to be a difficult game. So it's not going to be, you know, very easy quick checkmates right away. But these positions are so, so much easier to play as a human from white's perspective rather than from black because you're always on the back foot as black. In these sort of positions, you have to defend and focus on protecting your king. Whereas as white, your options are very flexible. You can continue marching forward and creating, you know, big attacks, taking up as much space as possible. And at any given moment, you can just retreat and start up a new plan. So these positions are very flexible. I enjoy playing them a lot. And I think you guys will have a lot of success playing the Jabava London in these sort of variations. If your opponent starts with h5, you can play knight f3, bishop g7, knight e5 right away. So without even this bishop g4 pin, of course, you know, maybe you get the bishop e4 pin now. You still have to go back to bishop e2. And these positions are very similar. There are very few minor nuances that you have to keep in mind. So I wouldn't really focus too much on memorizing move order specifically, but rather the ideas. After 95, our plans are still the same. We want to play g4 and expand further. We want to play bishop e2 first, but then follow it up with g4. This will allow us to create a kingside attack. And pretty much in all Jabba London positions, we want to at some point play the move g4 because it's ultra aggressive. It's very difficult to deal with. And especially in these positions where black is most likely castling inside. More detailed variations are mentioned in my Jabba London video with the move g6. So feel free to check that out. But now let's move over to the move e6. 
The point of e6 is that this bishop opens up now and allows for this bishop b4 pin. Black is solid, but can't really create any sort of attacks. We can start with a3. We don't need to allow this bishop b4 pin, and we're really not in a rush to create any sort of attack. Maybe d7, and we get g4 with the intention of kicking this knight out. Uh, we might get h6. You're going to follow it up with h4. We're just going for g5. Really don't need to wait that much. Here we can play rook b1. You could also play, you know, knight a4 even. You could play b3. The engine likes b3. And also likes rook b1. So both moves are completely fine. I like rook b1. This does have a concession. It does prevent us from uh, castling queenside. But our king is quite safe in the center right now. So it's not really that big of a worry. Here your opponent can really easily mess up. Uh, the engine likes a5 here. But... It's very difficult to spot that idea. So let's say your opponent plays naturally, like with bishop e7, for example. This right away allows us to play queen f3. And from here, our game plan is quite simple. If your opponent chooses to castle, right away they're going to be lost just because of the move g5. Of course, this trade is impossible because this knight has to move somewhere and wherever it moves. This allows queen h5. If the knight moves here, you can still play queen h5. This is almost guaranteed mate. I mean, f6 stops it, but come on. This is just... An amazing position. So that means your opponent cannot trade this pawn. Of course, if your opponent does something else, like move this knight out of the way, let's say right here, you can still trade, and this is super advantageous. I mean, there are so many good moves here. It's very difficult to mess up. You can just play queen g4, pour this knight out of here, and then take this pawn. So if your opponent decides to castle kingside, that's going to be quite amazing for us. Like I mentioned, this g5 idea is super powerful, and Right away, just like a ticking time bomb for black here because it's just very difficult to defend all of this. Now, what if your opponent decides to not castle and look for other ideas? Well, black needs to open up his position, right? Because otherwise, black is always going to be cramped. And the only real way to do that here is with the move e5, which sacrifices a pawn. You're going to take this pawn, knight e4, you just play knight g2, and this is very nice as well. Pretty much whatever happens here, you're going to be at an advantage. Uh, if this knight trade occurs, well, this is quite simply a better position. So yeah, the only real thing that black can do is play e5. If your opponent jumps with this knight to e4 right away, this is just a free pawn. Uh, the biggest difference here between e5 and knight e4 right away is that after e5, the spawn trade occurs and it opens up the board for black. So it is advantageous in some sense. However, at the end of the day, this doesn't really work for black. And we just maintain a solid, sizable advantage in both variations. Guys, that sums up e6. Let's look at the move queen b6 now. This is the final move of the four that I wanted to show you today. This is probably one of the easier variations throughout all of the Jabava London. There really isn't all that much to memorize, which is very nice for us. Because this position is super solid, there just isn't that much theory to go by. So you just have to play aggressively and you're going to be able to maintain some pretty decent advantages. Queen b6 aims at the spawn, activates the queen. It's an interesting sideline. A couple of people have tried it, but... Uh, it's super simple to play against. All you need is knight a4, and now the queen goes back to d8, and that's it. Then you just continue with knight f3, or bishop e2 and g4. So nothing really changes for us uh, in this variation, but if your opponent tries to go for some sort of queen a5, you can play c3 here, uh, and you're just better. b5 doesn't work because of knight c5, and if the knight was on d7, this wouldn't have been very good, because we would have a weird pawn on c5, you know, doubled pawns, not very good. But since there's no knight on d7, we don't have to worry about that. We can keep this knight on c5 for as long as we'd like. And we're very happy here. The moment we see knight b to d7 or knight f to d7, uh, we just take this knight. And we have a plus 0.7-ish advantage. Of course, your opponent can try other things um, instead of going the queen back and just developing the knight, for example. At that point, we're able to play b4, take up more space on the queen side. This, though, means that we're not going to be castling queenside. And since we've developed all these pawns, actually, we're likely going to be castling kingside. So we're going to develop bishop d3, knight g2, or more likely knight f3. And then we're going to castle kingside and have a pretty stable game. At that point, our whole intention kind of switches from this g4, g5 idea to uh, just playing very simply on the queenside and expanding with these pawns. So something like rook b1 is possible in the future, maybe queen b3 or queen d3. And then intending to push this b pawn up and just breaking open the spawn structure using this sort of uh, minority attack plan. And from here, the game goes on. So use the plans I have just mentioned, and you're going to be completely fine. If you encounter a b5 in the future, let's say bishop d3, b5, you can just jump this knight to c5 now, thanks to the spawn on b4, because uh, this pawn structure is very much fine for you. A pawn structure where there was no pawn on b4, and you had to recapture with your d pawn was not fine for you. So this is quite good. 
Guys, this summarizes everything I wanted to show you for the C6 variation of the Jabava London video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider checking out a video to my left. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in a future video.